Thank you for coming on tonight's tour. Um, my name is Bruce Barnes from the New Bedford Preservation Society, and um, we're doing the Historic District tonight, which is, uh, I haven't done the dist for Historic District in a long time, especially since the Park Service has free tours on a regular basis. But I think our tour is going to be pretty interesting, talking about the, mostly what the Whaling National Park has to offer, and the history of the city really begins here as a major commercial center. Um, lots to talk about here. Um, and we're starting here at the Customs House, built in 18, the eight, mid 1830s. By the time the Customs House was built in, 1830, in the 1830s, New Bedford really was booming at the time from the whaling industry. Um, hundreds of ships were being uh, sent across the oceans of the world to, to uh, collect whale oil from sperm whales for the most part. And um, when they brought it back, um, the government obviously gets its take from duties and so forth. Um, the Customs House was designed by a man by the name of Robert Mills. He was a government architect, um, pretty famous architect from the South, South Carolina. His most famous commission is the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. So he wasn't a small timer. He was an important architect at the time. Um, there were other architects designing in this exact style in New Bedford. Um, this is the only the building he did, but it looks kind of similar to the houses on the stone houses on County Street and so forth. The, how, the building is in the Greek Revival style. Looks like a Greek temple. Um, beautiful um, uh, columns, beautiful stonework on this particular building. It has. It doesn't have its cupola anymore, although it's ca it was called an observation observatory when it was built. But when, if you, when we get away from the building, you see this four chimneys, actually, those four structures that are on the roof are chimneys. And there was, there was a glass building, a glassed-in building with windows up there at one time. It looks like a cupola. They called it an observatory. Another interesting part about this building when it was built, um, and it was made aware uh, to me when I was giving a tour to the Victorian Society, and the man who was leading that tour was very, very knowledgeable. His name was Richard Guy Wilson, a very uh, important uh, architectural historian working at the University of Virginia. And he told me that this building was built with fireproofing. And I didn't know what, how that could be, actually. But we were walking around after lunch, and he said, you know, this building was built with fireproofing. You know, I'd like to see it. And I said, well, why don't we just walk in and ask if we can see it, if, if it ex still exists, whatever that was, whatever this, whatever, however they did this, you know? And they did. They said, yeah, go ahead. And you can see it in the back of the building. The building was also the post office when it was built in the 1830s. So it's, there's the back of the building isn't really occupied anymore. And they have this kind of odd baffling of the ceiling and the walls and so forth, which was made, which was built to contain a fire. Um, there had been a lot of wood fires in cities, and when one building started to burn, they spread quite a bit. So this wasn't a fireproofing in the sense of keeping the building from burning down, but keeping the building that was burning from spreading. That's basically what that was all. But it's an interesting feature. It's in this particular building. Now, many people, when we go on the tours, when we're doing the big houses and some of the other grand buildings in town, they've asked, where did the granite come from? Now, and I always say, well, you know, Fall River had a huge quarry. Lots of the, lots of the granite from, from the, uh, the buildings in New Bedford came from the big quarries in Fall River. But the government being the government, this granite came from Hallowell, Maine. Huh? Hallowell, Maine, which is near Augusta. We're not talking about you know a port city, you know, where, the, where they could just float it down, you know, the river, the ocean, and get it here. No, Hallowell, Maine. So, even though there was, there was quarries all around, they specified this very remote uh, uh, granite for this particular building. Any questions about the Customs House? Um, the, my final point about the Customs House and customs and tariffs that they collected here. For all the years of the early republic, from the time of the Constitution in the 1780s till the Civil War, the entire government, the United States federal government, was funded by tariffs and duties collected at the Customs House. There were no income taxes. There was no other types of taxes like that. All the, fun all the funding for the federal government, this is Congress, the military, the po all those types of things, was funded by tariffs and duties collected at customs houses across the country. 
on this site, right next to the Customs House, all the way to Cushnet Avenue, was built in 1892 and opened in 1893, a United States Post Office. If you follow us on Facebook, I put a te we put teasers up uh, on what is this building um, and where was the eagle that um, we're going to, I'll show you where it is on, on, on Elm Street, at the top of this particular structure. The uh, post office was, was built, again, it was a government contract, government lawyer, uh, government architect, built it here. Um, it wasn't a particularly attractive building. When you look at it in pictures, it kind of looks like a squat pumpkin, actually. You know, kind of big and round, peak. Um, it, it's, it has a style that's not too different from the first floor of the Freestones now, big arches and so forth. It wasn't a particularly attractive building, and it wasn't very functional either. Um, the city was growing at a tremendous pace in the 1890s, and it was obsolete within about 15 years. And in the early decade of the 20th century, we built the new post office that currently is the post office in New Bedford on Pleasant Street. So the building was obsolete. It was a postal annex for a while, and it, and it served lots of other purposes. But it had a big, it had a, an A-frame arch over the front entrance, which was right about, right about here, I would guess, right in the middle of the of the building. And at the top of that uh, A-frame was a was a carved stone eagle, about six feet tall on about a six foot tall base. So, when they were going to Demolished, when they were demolishing the building in 1955, they hired a person. Apparently, the interior of the building was beautifully appointed. Tons of beautiful marble, lots of woodwork, and the demolition company was going to salvage all that stuff. But the eagle was too difficult to bring down. Because, you know, people wanted to save the eagle. The town wanted to save the eagle. And in an article in 1955, they had, this, they had this headline that said, Eagle Doomed on Demolition of Post Office. We'll post the, the headline of that on the video when we put the video out. Um, so it looked like the eagle wasn't going to be saved. But because he said he had, he had the, 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 the uh, salvager said he had offers to, to buy the eagle, but it would have taken too much money even to take it down. But somehow it was saved. The eagle was saved. He, he made appearances at various buildings and so forth throughout the city over the years. He had a nickname, Mr. Steadfast. That was his nickname. He was in front of the old Channel, I guess, I don't remember this myself, but I guess he was in front of the Channel 6 building on County Street. He was other places, spent a lot of years in the yard, the, the, the New Bedford yard amongst the weeds and so forth. But he survived. And they beautifully installed, the city did something really good. They installed him at the end of Elm Street. We can see him from a distance if you're not familiar with Mr. Steadfast, but he still lives as a nice monument to the, to the city, really, um, down there at, at the Elm and uh, the highway. Um, so that's the story about the library here and Mr. Steadfast, who, thank God, did survive the demolition. The two buildings across the street built as banks. The Freestones building, you can see, says Citizens National Bank built as a bank in the 18, late 1880s and uh, finished in 1891. And the Visitor Center, which was originally the New Bedford Institution for Savings, and built in the 1850s. Now, the, reason, the only point I want to make about these two buildings is their use of brownstone. We, you know, everybody's heard about brownstone, Brooklyn brownstones, and the brownstones in various neighborhoods in New York and so forth. This, the facade here, is brownstone. It doesn't refer to the brick, it refers to this stone right here. And on the visitor center, the facade is brownstone as well. Two different tones of brownstone. It was a very highly desirable uh, building material, decorative building material in the years before, um, especially before the, the Civil War, but particularly afterwards. A lot of brownstone on the Grace Church was built in the 1880s. Lots of brownstone's been used since then, but it was used a lot in the years before um, the Civil War. And a lot of the brownstone is quarried in Connecticut. Um, the town of Portland, Connecticut, which is right across the river from Middletown, if you know anything about Connecticut, um, there's a big giant quarry 
that was there. I think probably the core, the brownstone from the, from the bank building came from that particular quarry. I'm not sure about this here. Um, and if you've driven from Middletown in Connecticut, which is about halfway between Long Island Sound and Hartford on Route 9, and you drove straight across to 91 and, uh, or 84 on the highway there, you'll see outcroppings that look just like this stone on the way over. Lots of brownstone in, in Connecticut. Probably, I'm pretty sure that this probably came from Portland, Connecticut, and this may have come in well because there was a lot of, lot of brownstone in Connecticut that was quarried, but there were other parts of the country too that, that, uh, where you could get it. And, um, um, and as we know, sometimes they didn't go to the easiest source to get their building materials, as we no, noted here. Any questions about, about that? Yes? So when did this become a courthouse? It was a courthouse after the, the New Bedford Institution for Savings built a beautiful bank where the Oceanarium was. Yeah. That's the, the, the next building. So after that, it became the third district court. Uh -huh. And then it was all kinds of things after that. It was a junk, junk dealer for a while. I, when I worked in New Bedford in the, in, the, in, in the library in the 1970s, it was a junk shop, and then it was an auto parts shop for a while at that time as well. So it's been a lot of things. But the bank re we purchased the building, if you remember, turned it into a bank again for a short time before the Park Service bought it. This beautiful federal style house built in the 1820s has been referred to as the Benjamin Rodman House, all its restored existence. It's a misnomer. This house was actually the second building of Samuel Rodman Sr. We're going to talk about him at his, the site of his first house. This is the site of the second house. Built this house in 1820s, documented a number of times in, in like the Roaches and a couple of other uh, uh, primary sources that Samuel Rodman built this as his second house in the 1820s. For some reason, and I think I know the reason, when they first did the research on this house in the 60s and 70s, they probably used the first New Bedford directory, which came out in 1836. Samuel Sr. died in 1835, and I think the directory listed his son, Benjamin, as living in the house, and that's where it came from. Because Benjamin probably lived briefly in the house, but he was a big landowner in another part of town. Um, his mother, Elizabeth Rodman, who was the subject of um, the VIP tour. Uh, I, I talked about her at length at that, on that tour. Um, she l lived in the house after um, um, her husband died and in fact sold the land to the bank of the bank. They, this was Rodman land and they sold the land for the bank in her lifetime. So, it, it says Benjamin Rodman, but it's actually Samuel Rodman Jr.'s sec, first, second house. It's one of the first houses built of granite in New Bedford. Um, they're not the, for, not the first, but it, we start, a lot of the early houses and big mansions were built of brick or brick with wood facades like the Mariner's Home we're going to talk about in a little while. But nonetheless, it's one of the first of the nice stone mansions built in the city. One of the few mansions in the historic districts that hasn't been moved to its location. Many of the other big houses have, in fact, been moved from one spot to another. Um, but anyway, it's a beautiful house, nice fan light window over the uh, front door, and um, just a nicely detailed building. If anybody recalls what this building looked like in the 60s, it had storefronts built all around it. It was a total mess, really. Um, but we managed to, we managed to save that. Preservation is one of the early preservation jobs in New, in New Bedford on an old house. They took all the storefronts away from the front and re redesigned, re restored the building. It was originally going to be and was the home of the Glass Museum, the New Bedford Glass Museum. That's one of the reasons they restored the house uh, uh, because they had a commitment from the Glass Museum to move into the site. They did move into it for a while. I don't know what how that didn't work out. Um, I know I, I knew some of the participants and who, who made that happen, but I don't know why it, it failed, but it did fail. But anyway, beautiful house still. I actually have not been in this building. Has anybody been in this building that they can recall? But anyway, it's, still, it's beautiful on the outside, but nicely preserved. The building behind me was the home of Andrew Robeson. And he was a pretty interesting guy. 
again, before I forget, this house was also moved. It was directly opposite the house originally. Now you got a picture, 1820s. Not much development here. This is a, this is a in, in the 1820s, this is still a fairly residential area. Customs house isn't here. Nothing's here except a few residences on, this, on these sites. His house was directly opposite the, the house we were just at, but almost backed up to uh, Kushnet Avenue. So there were, he had a big garden in front. He owned all this block, and he had a nice big garden in front, Andrew Robeson. He was born in, in the late 1780s. He married into the Rodman family, married a daughter of Samuel Rodman Sr. And um, he got involved. He was a pioneer in the fall of a textile industry. He lived in this house. Um, he was a printer of fabrics. That was his, that was his claim to fame. The finishing of, of, of woven goods was a cottage industry, actually, before, this, before um, the 1820s, when people like um, Robeson got involved with mass, uh, mass printing of, of woven products, woven cotton and wool. And he set up a factory in Fall River, not, foo, not too far from where the uh, government center in Fall River is, if you drive through the highway, um, on, the east, on, the, on the west side of the government center, just about below there, he had a big factory, and he printed uh, cotton and wool cloth and it was really kind of revolutionary for the area he made a fortune he made a fortune doing this now he lived here the whole time and I just read a little bio about him um, doing preparing for this particular tour and in that bio it says that he commuted every day from his house which would have been over here, but even if it was here, from here to Fall River, every day. He took a route that either went through the head of Westport, which is Old County Road, Old Westport Road, or Hicksville, which is Old Fall River, Old Bedford Road. And I thought, that must have taken him. He said he had fast horses and so forth and a nice buggy, blah, blah, blah. But it's still, it must have taken him to take that route on the crappy, um, excuse, excuse me, on the lousy roads that, that were there at the time. <laughs> It must have taken him two hours each way, had to have. He couldn't have gone, you know, he couldn't have driven the horses that fast, even though he said in the article he had fabulous, fabulously fast horses and so forth. But nonetheless, I knew he had commuted from previous things I had read, but I figured he went on a Monday and came back on a Saturday or something like that or Friday. No, it said in this book distinctly, and it was an old, it was a person who probably knew that it was true, that he would commute every day by by one horse buggy to and fro. He was heavily involved in the, uh, in the whaling industry as well. When you look at uh, the, the whaleman shipping list, which is a list of all the, a newspaper, a weekly newspaper that made a list of all the, all the whale ships that went out. He owned a number of whalers as well. There was a little, a little booklet that came out every other year or so. I don't know who published it, but it was the richest men in, in Massachusetts. And he was at the top of the list a couple of times. And, you, and in New Bedford, we had some very wealthy people, James Arnold and the Rodmans and Roaches and, and so forth. But he was the, at the top, and John Avery Parker, he was at the top of the list a couple of times um, for his, uh, his work as a pioneer in the textile industry and also in the whaling industry. Andrew Robeson died in 1862. He had a grandson that was killed at the Battle of Gettysburg. So. These were people that, uh, were, you know, were committed in, in more ways than one. Siemens Bethel, probably the most iconic building in the district, immortalized by Herman Melville in Moby Dick, built in the 1830s originally. It was a Greek Revival style, and um, but had a major fire in the 1860s and sort of remodeled it looks more has more gothic features now i think than it did but anyway beautiful building lots of history um when melville came here in the in december of 1840 it was been the old style building but nonetheless um, there wasn't too many changes and the cenotaphs or the cenotaphs that are inside were inside at that time as well it, the building was only eight years old when he came here, but the marble 
um, monuments inside were, were there uh, already. Now, the Siemens Bethel was, was a brainchild of the rich people in um, New Bedford as uh, something for the transient sailors that came to New Bedford on an annual basis. Now, by the 1830s, New Bedford probably had 300 ships in service, whaling. And each ship had a crew of about 30 people. And because they had the whale boats, each whale boat had six people, it was about 30 people on each whale boat, each whale ship. And probably two thirds of them were people from kids from the farmland, whale away from New Bedford by that time. The only locals that were involved at the industry being the captains and the mates and probably like the cooks and, and so forth. But most of the regular seamen were not from New Bedford. They were transients. Probably as many as eight, 9,000 transients would come and go from New Bedford during these years. And by the 1830s, in this section of town, there was a lot of temptation. And so, which um, what was, you know, and we'd had some issues with that with in the in New Bedford with prostitution um, in the past in this in this area so they wanted to build something that would um, perhaps help people to come and feel a little bit more welcome and uh, that's what the Port Society New Bedford Port Society which still exists I believe um, <clears throat> um, was all about to, for the welfare of these transient seamen who were young boys and men for the most part from other parts of the country um, and they wanted to make sure that they didn't uh, stray too far from the straight and narrow. The bowsprit pulpit in the building, which is described in Moby Dick, is not original to either one of the versions of the building. Um, that was the, a figment of uh, Melville's imagination, a nice, a, nice, uh, a nice touch. And over the years, I looked, there's two or three versions of when the bowsprit uh, pulpit was put in, bowsprit pulpit was put in. I don't know which one is accurate, I haven't studied it that much, but that's a fairly recent uh, invention based on the description that Melville made in Moby Dick. The Mariner's Home, again, the date's wrong. It's built in 1790. It's been documented in any number of places that they built the house in 1790. It was the first house of William Roach Jr. William Roach Jr. was um, grandson of the founder of, of the Roach Whaling House, originally from Nantucket. They're the ones, the Roach family, the ones who moved to New Bedford in the years just prior to the American Revolution in the 1760s and established a whaling uh, uh, a branch of their business here. It was thrived for a number of years before the American Revolution. The revolution did bad damage to the, to the uh, whaling industry in New Bedford. The British came and basically burned all the commercial buildings um, during, that, during, this, during the American Revolution. And William Roach Jr. was assigned to come to New Bedford and rebuild what, was, what had been destroyed. And he did so magnificently. He was a very, very important man in New Bedford. Um, established all sorts of, of civic and, and cultural um, organizations. He was the founder of the Friends Academy, the same Friends Academy that now exists on Tucker Road was a building that was on County Street and it was the brainchild of uh, William Roach Jr. and Samuel Rodman Sr. who we're going to talk about in detail in a little while. Um, when Roach died, the house really wasn't here originally. It was on Water Street. They just moved it straight back to this location in, 18, in, the, in a year or so after Roach died in 1850. His daughter, Sarah Arnold, who was James Arnold, the Wamsutter Club Arnolds, um, she, uh, in, she inherited the building, gave it to the Port Society at that time, and for a hundred years or more was used as a, a home for transient mariners. They could stay in the, in the uh, mariners, that's why it's called the Mariners Home. Pat just, you know, described what's, how it's occupied now, but it, that, it was a mariners home into the, I don't know, to, to recent, recent years actually. The, um, the building is a brick building with a wood facade. Yep, you could see the brick. If you go around the corner, you could see the brick 
um, structure. RJD, which is William Roach Jr.'s second house, is a brick building that's completely, completely rebuilt with a wood cladding. So it looks like a wood house, and it is a wood house in a sense, but its, founda its, its structure, foundation, its, its, its framing, it's not isn't framing, is, is brick. Very unusual, I mean, but that's how they engineered those houses in those days. They hadn't really used balloon style. Well, anyway, the, the building techniques had got better as, as they got along. Anyway, beautiful building, kind of plain. This three-story mansion style was very popular in Bedford until the 1820s. Um, lots of houses were like this. When you look at the old history books of houses in New Bedford uh, that were built in the 1780s, early 1800s, they look very similar to this with very just small detailing where the differences was sort of the style in New Bedford was a very plain Quaker influence style, I believe. In, 18, in, the, in the late 1880s and early 1890s, the city of Chicago planned a spectacular World's Fair. It was to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the Columbus discovery of America. It was called the Columbian Exhibition. And it took place, actually, it didn't take, take place in 1892, but 1893. It was, the, it was the greatest World's Fair that the United States has ever sponsored. It was absolutely magnificent. And there were huge exhibits for all sorts of things, in industry, um, commerce, uh, arts and all sorts of things and the states had their own buildings and the cities were also invited to make an exhibit a special exhibit if they wanted to do so you know Bedford was a fairly important city at the time in the country more so than now as far as being and having national significance and New Bedford was invited to make it to to have an exhibit a special exhibit at this World's Fair in Chicago well, the textile industry was booming at the time. New mills were going up all over the place. A tremendous amount of investment. People were proud of the fact that we had this new way of doing business. The city was growing and so forth. But the city had other ideas. They decided to send a whale ship to this exhibit. Well, the textile men were thrilled about that. And they had a lot of power in the city. But nonetheless, city held for them. And they they refitted a whaler called the Progress. Strictly coincidental that the Progress would be used in this particular case. They fixed it up, outfitted it to it, the best they could. It looked like it was like a tip-top shape whaler, sent it to Chicago. And it was the official exhibit for New Bedford at the Columbian Exhibition. The exhibition only lasted for five or six months. That was the only plan. It was the summer of 1893. The World's Fair took place, it was fabulously attended, and then it ended. And the city never retrieved the progress. It just left it there. Well, in 1902, everybody sort of forgot about the progress, and then somebody torched it at a dock in Chicago. And the paper, the, new, the, the Evening Standard at the time, wrote an article about the inglorious end of the progress. What happened? Why did we leave it there? We just left it there to have somebody burn it down? It was very embarrassing. And it wasn't long after that. And I think there was a sentiment growing in the city that we had to preserve our whaling heritage. And, and, they did, and so I, I don't know if the, progress, the demise of the progress, it was written up in the paper. Oh, you know, I, have, I, I think we'll probably post the headline that appeared in the paper on the video when, when Steve does the video. But it wasn't too long after that that the Old Dartmouth Historical Society was formed in, in 1903, and then shortly thereafter, they decided to put the Whaling Museum here. Um, I think that there was, it was just one of the pieces that made people think, we can't lose that heritage. We've got to start collecting it and remembering it and, you know, and, and, and showing it off and not just letting it die a death like the progress did. Um, so anyway, and the Whaling Museum, as we know it today, is one of the great museums. It's, a, one of, it's really the jewel of the city. It's a fabulous collection. Um, everyone is proud of the museum. It has been a great museum for a long, long time. I remember even when I was a kid coming to New Bedford and, and everybody talked about the museum. 
uh, as a very special place, and it continues to be a special place. Um, but um, you know, I, it, it, in 1900, I think the whole whaling heritage thing was was at risk, um, and thank God they saved it in time. This site behind you, to the corner, was the original was the site of the original site of the Samuel Rodman Senior House. He had a large two-story feral style right on the corner here of Water Street. And when he built the house, really, there was no William Street. It was just a, it was just a dirt path. And his friend and brother-in-law, William Roach Jr., lived in the Marinus home, which is now right next door, right where, the, right where, the, uh, where, that, where that car is, the, right in that corner. They lived side by side. The Roaches and the senior married William Roach's sister, whose name was also Elizabeth, and they had two other siblings that married into the family. So they were very close commercially and as well as um, in the family sense. Samuel Rodman Sr. was born in Newport in the 1750s. His father was a seaman, but died at sea when Rodman was probably a teenager. He had a large group of uh, of brothers and sisters. He had a lot of siblings. And Samuel was taken in by the Rivera family in Newport, Rhode Island, where he was born and living. And the Riveras, one man by the name of Jacob Rivera, he had developed during the time that Rodman was living there as a teenager, the formula for making spermaceti candles. Now, one of the products of sperm whales, other than the blubber for oil, is a substance called spermaceti, which is a waxy, oily substance in the head of the sperm whale. If you know what it's, if you can recall what a sperm whale looks like, it's got this big blocky head in front. And the head is a is filled with this substance, which the which the whalemen called spermaceti. And it was used for echolocation, actually. I don't know how what the chemistry or anatomy is, but it was it was different from, from blubber. And the spermaceti was was used to make candles. And Jacob Rivera, while Samuel Rodman Jr., I mean Samuel Rodman Sr. was living with him as a youngster, had developed the formula, the best formula for making spermaceti candles. It was a closely held secret for many years because they were these candles were highly prized and long burning and bright and so forth. So they were a very, very valuable uh, commodity. So when Rodman came of age, he moved to Nantucket to make his fame and fortune, got hooked up with the roaches as a candle maker. He knew the formula. And so his specialty, even though when he moved to New Bedford, he moved to New Bedford with the rest of the roaches in the late 1790s, his specialty was candle making. And it's kind of apt. I mean, that wasn't the only thing he did. He was a whaling merchant of all kinds. He was, he was involved in all the commercial interests, banks and so forth that, um, they, that he did at the time. But it is apt that the one thing that saved from Samuel Rodman Sr. is the candle works he built in 1810 because that's what his specialty was. Um, this building is interesting. It's only, originally was only finished on two sides. He didn't want to waste money on sides that were, weren't going to be seen. <laughs> so he finished these sides, but it's a nice building, very highly detailed for a factory. Basically, it's a factory building. It's not a house or anything. It's a factory building. He made candles in there. Um, but anyway, Rodman uh, Sr. was an uh, um, interesting guy. Um, he was really played second fiddle to, William, to his, his brother-in-law, William Roach Jr., most of his life. But nonetheless, a uh, very influential and important man in the early history of New Bedford. This is the Double Bank building. One of the, and again, one of the great buildings in the city, built in the 1830s, designed by the architect uh, Russell Warren, who was responsible for a lot of the big buildings in the city, the public library, the big stone mansions on County Street, a number of other buildings. He also was responsible for the visitor center, actually, as well. Um, but these big, giant, monumental Greek buildings are a specialty here in New Bedford. He did a lot of them. Um, it's called the Double Bank Building because um, there were two banks that were built at the site. It was, it was built for two separate banks. Now. The story goes that there were two separate contractors that built the building. 
and I really can't see it, but four of these columns are a little skinnier than, the, than four of the other ones. I gotta tell you, it's pretty hard to, to see. I guess a keen eye can see it, but I don't have a keen enough eye to see it. But four of the columns are skinnier than the other four. One of the reasons they're called double bank as well, because the columns are different. Um, one of the beautiful things about the building as it sits today, one of the TV stations, I think it's channel 10, has one of these cameras that's on the uh, Regency building. And before the sun comes up, this building is lit up. It, and when they pan over the city on one of these cameras, this is the building that's lit up. It looks magnificent. It makes the whole city look like a million bucks, really, because it's, it's so beautiful. It's beautiful no matter where you look at it from, but it's really built beautiful when it's lit up like that from afar. Um, just a great building. It's been lots of things. It was Wales office, I think, for a while. And it's been lots of things over the years. Um, hasn't been a bank building for quite a few years, over 100 years now. But nonetheless, it, thank God it's been, been, been saved. Again, um, there's a, columns, are, the, all the columns in New Bedford, except the ones at the, the, the Customs House, most of the columns on the big buildings were specified to be of wood and, uh, and still are of wood. I mean, if you, you know, when you knock on them and stuff, you can tell that they're wood. Uh, and that's how they were, that's how they were built and, and prescribed during the start. The, the Roach Rodman House, the, the Grinnell Mansion, all those houses, the columns were wood. The Water Street, especially the, the east side of Water Street, really hasn't changed architecturally since it was built in the 1820s. And it's really kind of remarkable that it lasted because this area of the city was, became very commercial at one point, and you would have thought that they would have been replaced. Like a lot of the buildings on the west side of the street have been replaced. You know, there was the same types of buildings on both sides, but this one, these buildings were replaced over time, and these weren't. So all of these buildings here that we see, and I'm not going to talk about any of them individually because it would take us forever. Because they're all worthy of, of their of discussion, but they were all built in the mostly in the 1820s and 30s. Um, very authentic still. They look just like probably just like they did in the day, um, and uh, it's great that that we, they've all been saved. Now, the building across the street for all those who went on the. Um, Howland Mill tour last year, or who, is, who have watched the video. This is the bank, this is the doorway that William D. Howland walked out that fateful day in 1897, empty handed after asking for his, the final loan, which he knew if he didn't get, his mill would fail. Walked out that building, walked down these streets to his dock at North, on North Street and took his life that day. Um, this is, the, this is the National Bank of Commerce. I'm kind of disappointed, actually, that the Whaling Museum sc scratched off the name, because the name was there not too long ago. It said National Bank of Commerce. This was the first building. Henry Holston Rogers, the famous man from Fairhaven, the rich man from Fairhaven, he bought the building after the bank went belly up. And then he gave it to the, for, for a song to the, Whaling, to the Old Dartmouth Historical Society. This is their first building. It's often referred to as the Rogers Building, but to me, it'll be the National Bank of Commerce Building because of the William D. Howland uh, connection. This site here is a site that many of us will remember, actually. The famous gas explosion in 1977 took place right here at a place called O'Malley's Tavern. 1977 was a uh, extremely cold winter that year. I was working in New Bedford actually at the time. I work at the library. And um, we haven't had in recent memory the river completely freeze over beyond the dike. I, it's been so long since that ha that that's happened. But that was the case in 1977. The, the river was completely frozen over. It was common in, in, in old years, but that year the river froze over, it froze over beyond the dike, in fact. There was even some wags in the paper were saying that if you were nimble enough, you could walk from Woods Hole to Martha's Vineyard on all the pack ice that particular winter, 1977. Anyway, 
On January 18th of 1977, there was a bar here called o O'Malley's Tavern. And around five o'clock in the morning, um, a pipe cracked because it was so cold that um, it, it just, you know, it sort of froze things below what they expected them to freeze. Pipe cracked. When the furnace went on, a gigantic explosion happened on this site. It blew, it blew in the wall. It didn't, didn't destroy the wall, but it blew in the wall of the YMCA. There was so many, all the build, all the, all the um, windows around here shattered. The Whaling Museum lost all their windows in the Bourne Building, all the windows. In fact, that big window you can see when you step back, completely shattered and shards of glass were embedded in the sails of the Lagoda. Yep. It was an unbelievable explosion. That built in the two buildings, the, the Sundial Building and the building next to it, were on fire and burned. The Sundial Building was restored a Herculean effort by whale actually to save that building because it was very badly destroyed. All the windows in the neighborhood were, were blown out. It was an unbelievable thing. The only good thing about the explosion was nobody was hurt. There was nobody on the street, there was nobody in the buildings. It's five o'clock in the morning and um, nobody was around um, to get hurt and no one was hurt. But um, it took them a long time to turn the gas off, turn the fires off. It was quite a day in January of 1977. On this site, the building faced Union Street was the Mansion House. If you follow us on Facebook, that's the last clue uh, or the teaser, there's a picture of the man Mansion House as it looked around 19, uh, probably 1880 or so. It was the home of William Roach Sr. William Roach Sr. was one of the most important Yankee whalemen in history, actually. He was the son of uh, the founder of the Roach whaling firm. Um, he uh, was mostly lived his life in Nantucket. He was the one that really made the, the whaling industry a, a international and huge money-making operation. Um, he had to fend off he wanted to maintain the industry's strength in Nantucket and with the family. Um, and by the 1750s and 60s, whale oil, oil was a very valuable commodity. Lots of money was being made harvesting and selling whale oil. So much so that, you know, rich people from other areas of New England wanted, to, wanted a piece of the action. The Browns in Providence, John Hancock in Boston, they tried to get into the industry as middlemen trying to control the oil market. And it was William Roach Sr. in the 1760s and 70s who fended them all off to maintain control of the industry in Nantucket. Um, he also set up a system, he, he set up the business as, an, uh, as a, a vertical integration, which means he owned every aspect of the business. He owned the ships that went whaling. He owned the factories that that refined the oil. He made the factories that sent the oil. He owned the ships that sent the oil. He owned every aspect of the Roach family, and it was because of William Roach Sr. He was born in 1734 and died in 1828, just to give you a time frame of when he was active. Um, the American Revolution was not kind to the whaling industry because we were a colony of England. The deal was, we, you know, the colony sent all the raw materials and goods to England and we got, uh, you know, sent back whatever. Um, and whale oil was one of the most important commodities, timber, tobacco, and whale oil. Um, and so when the revolution started, our, we were favored tra trade status beforehand, and all of a sudden we were the enemy. And Roach made, it's amazing how many trips he made back and forth from, New, from Nantucket to, to Europe, mostly England, to try to secure markets, try to sell product when, you know, when it was the toughest time to do so, and he was somewhat successful. Just a remarkable man. After the uh, revolution, his son, William Roach Jr., had established New Bedford as a very, very viable um, whaling port. It seemed he was getting old. He decided that he would move, he would just let his son take over the business. 
He moved his assets, all the assets that the Roach family had in Nantucket and settled here in the 1790s and built his home on this site. From day one it was called, in about 1795. From day one it was called the Mansion House. If you're familiar with that painting, New Bedford Four Corners, the Four Corners painting, everybody has seen that picture. He's in the, his house, he's, in the, he's the guy in the carriage, but his house is in the uh, upper um, left corner around, with the poplars all around it. That's the mansion house, if you look at the Four Corners picture. Um, he lived in the house until he passed away at 94 years old in, in 1828. He willed it to his daughter, Mary Roach, but she, it, the house was too big for her. So she, they, she sold it, and for many years, it was a famous hotel and restaurant. They added to the back of the house. So when you look at that picture, you'll see, boy, it's, it really is big in the back. Those are all additions, rooms. They actually had office build, used it as an office building as well. And it was a very famous building for many, many years, most of the 19th century, actually. But as time went on, this end of Union Street was not fashionable at all anymore. And um, it kind of fell into uh, disrepute. And when it uh, burned down in 1928, um, one, of the, one of the newspaper men said, it wasn't a house, it wasn't a building that was frequented by reputable people. <laughs> in other words, it was probably a brothel. Um, it burned down <clears throat> to the ground in 1928, but when they, when they demolished the remains and, and cleaned up the site, they did find some tunnels blocked off, but tunnels that led to the waterfront. And there was speculation that they might have been underground railroad tunnels or maybe even Shanghai tunnels for all we, for all we, for all we know. They, could, they didn't really follow up on it to, to figure out where they went. But there were tunnels underneath the house, underneath the mansion house that led to the waterfront. Thank you all for coming and uh, we'll see you next time.